Hi everyone, and thank you for joining our fireside chat today. We are the 25th of April, and actually, two days ago, UK SORA came into effect. Uh, in that context, I am delighted to welcome Anthony Venet of Across Safety Development because he was the technical author of BSI Flex 1906, which is actually a very useful tool for drone operators and UAS manufacturers in the context of implementing UK SORA. So, Anthony, can you explain to us what is Flex 1906 and what's the uh, uh, context of it? Hi, Annalise. Uh, really nice to see you again. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, I was invited by BSI to be the technical author for, for this FLEX, um, supported by uh, an advisory group made up of uh, just over 20 different organisations, RPAS UK and your good self being one of the members of the advisory group. Um, and the idea behind the FLEX was to support industry in the implementation of SORA in the UK, because it is a pretty complex um, uh, requirement uh, and there are a lot of a lot of different elements to it and navigating your way through there um, particularly when it comes to requirements that call for a standard to be applied and by a standard I'm talking about you know an internationally recognized standard by a standards body like BSI or RTCA or Eurokai um, so helping uh, operators and manufacturers in the UK industry to understand how they're going to be able to comply with different requirements in SORA that specifically ask for a standard to be referenced. Uh, and, th and that's what, what it was about. And so, uh, I mean, obviously, I was uh, part of the working group, so I've, um, you know, I've read, it, uh, obviously, the, the document. Uh, maybe for our members and uh, people uh, watching us, um, we can explain that the outcome uh, and the scope of your work was uh, to focus on cell one, two, and three, and focusing on those requirements referring to a standard and that list is on page one of your of uh, of the document so it's also two three eight and sixteen as well as containment requirements the uh ground risk mitigation m2 and finally the uh, functional test-based methods so it's a relatively short list i mean we've got uh maybe eight eight elements in there Maybe you can explain to us, um, you know, the work done and maybe pick one of those OZOs or containment or one of those elements uh, to explain how uh, operators and manufacturers can use uh, Flex 1906. Sure. Um, so, yeah, as you step up through the different sale levels, you encounter more and more requirements where a specific standard um, needs to be referenced. Or, I shouldn't say a specific standard, that's the problem. It, it references a, a standard, but it doesn't tell you which standard, right? So um, that's the challenge for uh, operators and manufacturers that we're, we're trying to help address. Um, and just to give a bit of background to that whole um, standards um, identification and, and, and the assessment of their appropriateness to, to meet the SOAR requirement, just a bit of background on that. So. Um, if we uh, look back to, to Europe in uh, 2020, uh, that's when EASA implemented um, SORA for the first time. And there were projects uh, conducted in Europe to uh, help identify standards that would be relevant to the SORA requirements, right? So the first one was AW drones, went from uh, 2019 to 2020, I think it was, um, where they just looked at, here's this, whole world of standards out there which ones could potentially be useful according to the different requirements in SORA. So they did that piece of work and then the next project that came along was a multi-year multi-million euro project called Project Shepherd uh, which was to do technical analysis of the standards that seemed most useful from the AW drones piece of work. So that was a very detailed analysis that worked from the perspective of here's a standard, which bits of this standard would be appropriate to use for SORA requirements, 
but also they looked at um, which bits of the standard would be useful for um, special condition light UIS and for uh, use space requirements in Europe as well. So it's a very big piece of work um, and it worked from the perspective of the standard back towards the requirements. Um, now, when we come to the UK SORA, what we're interested in is working from the requirement out to the standards, so kind of in the other direction. And we're only interested in which standards are going to be uh, relevant to our particular um, UK version of SORA. And there is a difference, right? So the, the European version of SORA is slightly different and based, um, or that piece of work was based on the uh, EASA SORA um, that uh, itself was based on the JARUS version of SORA 2.0. Now in the UK, we're on to JARUS version 2.5 of SORA, and it's the UK version of that one. So then there are some differences to apply, right, from the work that um, Project Shepherd did um, to what's relevant in the UK. So our project wasn't to go out and redo all of that work. Right? A lot of people have spent a lot of time and, and effort uh, on the analysis of the standards. We were just trying to distill that work down into a more user-friendly document that's specific to what we need to address here in the UK. And we started with uh, sale levels one, two, and three. Really the standards requirements start kicking in mostly at sale three and above. Uh, and the intention there was just to take a, a manageable chunk uh, of those requirements and address them in the flex with a view to potentially addressing higher sale uh, score requirements further down the track. Um, because it's anticipated that most of the operations initially in the UK are going to be sale one and two probably, uh, and, and people extending out into sale three, which um, uh, is going to be the starting point. So uh, that, that was the reason for the scope of the, the flex as it was. So to look at a particular example um, in the flex, um, uh, let's look at, at OSO3 um, uh, by way of, a, of an example we can work through. So OSO3 is about the UAS being maintained by a competent and or proven entity. Right? So it kicks in at, at sale three, where we have a requirement that comes in um, for the uh, procedures uh, criterion. And it says that the layout of the UAS maintenance program must be developed to a standard or means of compliance acceptable to the CA. So that's the, the, the ones that make the cut for inclusion into this uh, flex. So the flex isn't a cookbook for how to address every requirement in SORA. It's just addressing these ones where it says a standard or means of compliance acceptable to the CA. Um, so for for this particular OSO, uh, the maintenance program, um, we then have to look at the, so that was the assurance requirement, just to go back a step, the insur assurance requirement was for a standard or acceptable means of compliance. And then we have to look at the integrity requirement, which is that the maintenance program must be developed um, to include scheduled preventative maintenance, um, and it has to be derived from the designers uh, maintenance requirements and it has to be adapted to the specificities of the intended operation. That's the, to paraphrase slightly, the, the UK SORA requirement for that one. So then we said, okay, well, that's the requirement. So what sort of thing are we looking for in the uh, standard or AMC? And essentially we're talking then about, you know, it should have guidance for the organisation in how you pre uh, present the scheduled preventative maintenance information um, and what sort of things should be included in there uh, as one part and then another part that we split out from that was okay and how are we going to identify adaptations um, that the operator should make to the designers scheduled maintenance requirements for the specificities of their operation so there were sort of two parts that we we considered when we looked at the SORA requirement and then we had a look at, well, what did Project Shepherd come up with in terms of uh, addressing this OSO? And frankly, there weren't any standards that Project Shepherd were able to um, assess that met that requirement. Um, now, in some cases in the FLEX, the standards that were identified 
maybe addressed part of the requirements, um, in which case we would then go on and say, well, it, the standard addresses this part of the requirement and this other part is a gap. In this case, there were no standards that could be applied. Um, beyond the analysis of the project shepherd output, we did also look at what sort of means of compliance were available um, as published by uh, either EASA or the CAA. Uh, and so EASA have um, published a, uh, an acceptable means of compliance, albeit in a proposal form at the moment. Um, and we identified in this case a proposal to issue a certification memorandum uh, to give it its, its proper title. Um, which is specifically written to address the EASA SORA OSO3 requirements. So in the FLEX, we're able to point people to that document, right? Because, the, okay, there isn't a standard identified that deals with this, but there is a means of compliance that EASA have developed. And in the absence of uh, anything specifically developed by the UK CAA, um, it would be a reasonable starting point for an operator or manufacturer to have a look at what is in the uh, EAS means of compliance and then propose that perhaps to the UK CA as the way that they will address it. Um, now we did also have a look at what's the difference between the EASA version of SORA for OSO3 and the UK uh, version of SORA for OSO3 uh, and in that case we could identify that um, the UK version is the one that includes the uh, modification according to specificities of the operation, uh, which doesn't exist in the EASA one. So, of course, that aspect wasn't addressed in the EASA means of compliance, and so we could identify that as a gap. <laughs> so, coming back to the original sort of task, so the, the manufacturer or operator looking at this OSO, could hopefully then say, okay, I can see this um, potentially, you know, unfamiliar um, uh, certification memorandum from EASA could be something I could look to apply to address a large chunk of the SORA requirement. And this other piece of the SORA requirement I can see is a gap that I'm going to um, need to uh, propose something myself. Uh, and that's a bit of a run through on, on how that process works and how we're hoping it's going to to help uh, industry. Okay, clear. So um, if we can try and uh, summarize in, uh, in, 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 I would say simple words coming from, from, from me, because I'm absolutely not a uh, standard expert. Um, UK SORA calls for uh, standards and means of compliance in several instances. And thank you so much. You've done the work of actually assessing what among all the different uh, standards that exist in the world today, essentially from crude aviation, what could be used or relevant to meet those requirements. And so operators do not have to scroll through ISO, EuroK, etc. It's been done, thank you, um, by the uh, Flex 1906 uh, uh, team, so that we know when there is a standard, when there are none, and when there are you know, standards and means of compliance that partially re uh, answer the question asked. Now, if I can be sort of uh, unpolitically correct, um, so, you know, SORA asked for standards before before the standards really exist in a way. Um, and some of the standards or means of compliance identified, for example, coming from crude aviation or uh, let's, let's be blunt, sometimes there can be also some over-regulation or over, over, um, over uh, re excessive requirements, let's put it this way, uh, in some means of compliance, even if they had been um, <clears throat> dedicated to uncrewed aviation. So are we, are we correct to say that actually um, all those documents and references are tools to help operators and manufacturers um, uh, make their case to the CAA, but when it is sort of disproportionate, then there is it is possible to offer maybe a lighter version of it. Um, what do you think? Yeah, uh, 
the the issue is that there were a lot of standards out there already, of course, for manned aviation requirements. And uh, in the absence of ones being specifically written for UAS, um, then you know the only place to look if you need to find a standard is is potentially one of these manned aviation ones. And in some cases, the proportionality of that uh, might be excessive for the um, sale level that um, that has been um, mm. that's at issue. So. Uh, there are cases um, in there where, um, for example, you know, Project Shepherd identified that yes, there is a standard here, um, but uh, potentially it's kind of overkill for uh, what Sora is actually asking for. Uh, and in that case, it might be appropriate for uh, the operator or the manufacturer to suggest um, a uh, just certain elements of that. Um, standard uh, would be proportionate and applicable to what they're asking for. Um, so that that's still a challenge that's out there, you know, until we have standards that are specifically developed to address SORA requirements, um, that will be an issue that, that, that the industry needs and the CA need to deal with um, to, to apply um, the requirements of the SORA. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, uh, I mean, we're, we're in it together uh, as an industry, together with the uh, regulator and uh, BSI. Uh, so it's the beginning of a journey. Uh, you know, UK SORA came into force two days ago. Um, so, I mean, it's great, uh, honestly, that the uh, work has been done because then operators and manufacturers can start from a basis um, and then we will continue the journey to uh, develop uh, standards and means of compliance that are that are required by by UK SORA essentially. Yeah, and it's it's going to I would imagine you know move from the lower sale levels to the higher sale levels as we go because it's about addressing need in the industry and um, you know first we've got to nail down the the lower sale and and mid sale uh, score requirements before we get into the higher ones. Um, and I would say that there's there's a lot of work going on um, here and abroad to develop um, standards that are uh, proportionate and uh, applicable specifically to the UAS requirements. So it's not the end of the story at the moment. This was a snapshot of what was available um, at the time that it was written, and there will be more standards coming along and, and being published and and no doubt more acceptable means of compliance um, written up by by the regulators as well as we go along. Okay, brilliant. Anthony, thank you so much for your insight. It's really helpful. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. And, um, and thanks to Alpass UK, of course, for, for all the uh, efforts on, the, on behalf of the industry and, and to yourself as well, of course. Thank you. Thank you.